Money Talks. I'm Genevieve Westcott with a special edition of Money Talks dedicated to new ways New Zealand's rural businesses can transform the way they operate for bigger profits and a bigger slice of the global pie. Question, what can this clever Kiwi creation tell us about the future of Kiwi agribusiness and the wonderful world of intellectual property and innovation? You'll find out soon from our experts. All this and much, much more coming up. But first, in another three months, it's all over. Another year done and dusted. And a great time to take stock of how the markets and commodities have fared so far. We're joined by ASB Rural Economist James Shortle. James, good to see you. Always good to be here. Let's start with the big money spinner, dairy. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, dairy markets have, uh, have have been pretty pretty good this year, to be honest. I mean, considering how much volatility we've seen around the world over the past couple of months, uh, they've held up really well. I mean, to be honest, they peaked, they, they went strongly. Um, international pr- prices grew, uh, increased strongly right through to about March of this year. And, and since that time, over the past couple of months, they have been easing, but they still remain uh, they still remain very strong, and um, which is which is positive in my eyes, considering uh, what, what has been happening around the world. How's production? been doing around the world because there have been some slowdowns. Yeah, I mean, uh, production around the world has actually been lifting year on year. And here in New Zealand, the likes of the US, Europeans, they have all been increasing um, through this through this, uh, through this this year. But through the middle part of 2011, uh, dairy production out of some of the markets like the US, um, those increases haven't been haven't been rising quite as strongly as they have been previously. So, you know, that, that's good news. I, I'm still, I still think that um, while we are seeing supply lift, um, you know, demand is still surpassing supply. So that's why we are, we are seeing uh, prices stay pretty high. And speaking of prices, long term, uh, what are you picking for the payout? Yeah, well, payout, I do think, it, it, you know, an economist always says, well, at some point, if your prices are high, then we're going to see supply come on board. And I do really think that that probably will be the case. The markets that we are supplying, they will lift their supply at some point. So at, at some point, we are going to see, start to see payout ease a little bit, but it's not going to ease too much. It's, going to, it's, it's still going to stay high. As, as I mentioned, it's gone through a structural change, and that structural change means payout's probably going to be over $6 over the long term. Sheep's had a great year. Let's talk about sheep. Yeah, well, prices just keep on uh, keep on going up, and um, you know this comes despite we've got a very high uh, pound um, uh, New Zealand dollar against the pound, and, and the UK market has been suffering a bit. So you know sheep prices have been lifting. So it's mainly a supply story in that part of the market. Yeah, and, and uh, globally we're seeing a few headaches, aren't we? Well, definitely. I mean, uh, global supply has been down, um, particularly out of this part of the world uh, last year with those big spring storms that really had a big effect on the market. And I really think that's what that's why we have. Uh, have seen prices lift. They're still they're still pretty strong, and I think they are going to be uh, strong right through this coming season. The real question is, uh, what does that mean long term? And I think some of the markets where you know dairy is uh, really positioning itself itself in the developing markets, um, those developing markets are probably more focused on white meat, um, you know, chicken, pork. Uh, so that's going to be an issue for the red meat sector and um, something that we need to grapple with. Yeah. Okay. And let's talk also about beef very quickly. How how is it shaped up so far this year? Yeah. Well, beef markets, uh, US beef prices staying very very strong, um, looking solid, and uh, you know, right now they are. Solid. I'm, I am picking that through the latter part of 2011, we may start to see an easing off because because of what's happening in the U.S. market. Uh, but that's uh, but those fundamentals are, are looking pretty good over the next couple of years. The real question, as I pointed out with uh, with with lamb, is that um, red meat consumption is not growing as strongly as other as other products. So uh, that's something that we need to tackle with, uh, you know, and um, and look for for new markets and new products. And of course, the high New Zealand dollar really whacks uh, beef. How come? Well, um, you know, our biggest market is the U.S. market, and so you know, when the uh, when the New Zealand dollar is very, very high as it is uh, currently, then uh, that, that, that that's going to have an impact. And unfortunately, the uh, the Kiwi dollar is going to stay high. We're actually picking that it's going to stay sort of between that 85, 88 cent mark against the U.S. potentially higher, uh, probably over the next 18 months to two years. Thanks, James. Coming up after the break, Dr. Arun Shaker and Paul Adams join our panel with their views on how New Zealand farmers and rural businesses must change the way they work to stay at the top of their game. But first, answer this in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. What remarkable feat did a young New Zealand farmer and inventor accomplish on his paddock on March 31st, 1903? The answer when we return.
Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, what remarkable feat did a young New Zealand farmer and inventor accomplish on his paddock on March 31st, 1903? Richard Pierce took flight nine months before the Wright brothers flew their first aircraft. Joining us now is Dr. Aruna Shaker, a senior lecturer in product development at Massey University School of Engineering and Advanced Technology in Auckland. She specializes in the product innovation process, methods, and best practices. And Paul Adams, CEO of Everage IP, who gets great ideas of Kiwi innovators out into the world markets. Thanks so much, both of you, for being here. And let me start, uh, uh, Aruna, by asking you uh, if you had to write a report card for just how innovative Kiwis are, what would it say? I think New Zealand as a nation is very innovative. Um, I know they've come from that number eight wire uh, adaptability. I think that's an advantage. They're very flexible. Um, New Zealand, of course, has some uh, disadvantages being, you know, so far away from world markets, but uh, if we had, say, an innovation World Cup, like the Rugby World Cup, I think the nation will do very well. Uh, I think in relation to the size of the population and the financial constraints, I think we are doing very well. But we're not yeah. as good as we should be. And Paul, I know that we've talked about this uh, on a previous show. Uh, tell me, um, is the number eight wire all we need these days to make it as great innovators in the world? No, uh, unfortunately we need a bit more than that uh, and that's been demonstrated time and time again. We're very good, as Aruna said, at coming up with ideas but we're not so good at actually commercializing them and turning them into money and we lack some of the key skills enable, uh, to enable us to do that essentially and one of the major ones is the capability and the management understanding of how to take an idea and convert it into money. Um, so yep, we're very innovative but we're not very good at converting it into money essentially. Overall, when we look at the agribusiness sector and the rural sector, how do you think that they do, Aruna? I think we've had a number of innovations coming out from the farm and, and the garage and the backyard, as you say. But uh, as uh, Paul mentioned, there are some world best practices, and that's one of the reasons why I've appointed an innovator in residence. Um, at Massey University, Albany campus, uh, to get us closer to industry, to be able to share the knowledge from worldwide best practices and tools. And one of the key messages from that is uh, preserving the knowledge that we generate out of product innovations. Knowledge capture, reusing that in other projects, because just having one innovation is not good enough. Companies need to come up with a stream of product innovations. And to do that, they've got to adopt best practices. The uh, spotlight now with this uh, program with the Innovator and in Residence is focusing on the front end, and as Paul mentioned, the commercial end as well. So I think we can improve the game of innovation. You know, pruning is the hardest job in the vineyard and can be the most expensive operation of the season. It's also getting harder as vineyards are expected to do more with less. So how do you continue to produce quality grapes with huge pressures on costs and good quality labor becoming increasingly scarce? You come up with this gizmo that lets you prune at a fraction of the price and effort. The Kiwi inventors say it delivers cost and productivity benefits without sacrificing vineyard quality. They say it's as good as if you pruned the whole vineyard yourself. So Paul, we've seen the climbing out. What to you makes this such a great idea, such a great innovation? Well, I think that it's solving a real significant need in the vineyard. Um, as we talked about, it reduces the cost of uh, pruning in the vineyard very, very substantially. And it also um, eliminates a whole lot of soft costs as well, so that there are costs involved with having teams of people going through the vineyard and pruning that vineyard, um, managing those people, etc. Now the single machine eliminates a lot of those costs and makes it a lot easier to manage the vineyard at the same time. It's been a great success. It, it really was a local solution to a local problem, wasn't it? Is this at the heart of every great idea that you see? Well, I think really more than anything else, um, for an idea to succeed, it has to be both technically feasible, so that it can actually be done. Um, with a, it, secondly, it needs to have a meet a value proposition, and this is definitely what the climber um, solution does as well, that it's solved a very, very significant need. And then um, finally, it has to make sense economically. 
Um, and again, Climber makes that, uh, the cost of the machine relative to the cost savings is a great, it makes sense to do it essentially. What kind of uptake has it had from around the world? Well, Climber have had great success in New Zealand. They've got a lot of machines charging around uh, vineyards in Marlborough and Blenheim, etc. And they have signed a, an agreement with a major manufacturer in Europe. And um, that agreement is going to enable them to push those machines out into Europe and then even further afield into the North America. And I think they have plans to expand into places like South America, etc. as well. It's a great story about how you can take a Kiwi agri-tech invention and turn it into a world success. Now, for 16 years, uh, uh, Aruna, you have been teaching product development at Massey right. University. Can anybody learn how to be a great innovator? Yes, absolutely. I think Massey University has been a pioneer in introducing this full four-year professional degree in product development and we've had it running in both campuses in Palmerston North and at Albany. And it's, it's a mix of engineering, design, and business aspects. So that's fantastic. And I think in the future, we're gonna have a lot of this multidisciplinary programs. Uh, next year, we are introducing this uh, industrial innovation across all of the engineers all, all through the years. And we are introducing a lot more project-based learning. So they're going to be applying a lot of the skills that we teach. So product innovation can be taught. It consists of a whole range of tools, methods, and innovative thinking. So Paul, uh, what are the biggest mistakes uh, the rural community, for example, might make if they thought they had a great idea? I think probably the biggest issues that we see is that first of all people uh, have a tendency to spend too long working on the idea itself without actually exposing it to the market and actually checking that that value proposition exists. So we see a lot of clients who come to see us and they might have spent five, ten years working in, uh, on an idea. The problem is is that in that time they've got an idea of what the market wants but the market might have moved on or it might be slightly different from what they think themselves. So I think the first problem that they run into is spending too much time a little bit isolated working on the idea that all by themselves without actually checking whether or not this meets the market's actual needs. I think the second problem is that in order to go from idea to money, there are a lot of different skill sets you need along the way, and it's very rare for them to be contained in a single person. So that um, there's a bit of a tendency to do it yourself, all by yourself, and work again in isolation. So I think a lot of those sort of rural innovators and entrepreneurs probably need to open up a little bit more and start going out and seeking support and assistance from people who have experience in how to commercialize, who've done it before, or going to Aruna's classes, etc., to understand understand, okay, I can do this bit really well, but I need some help doing these other bits along the way. Innovation is complex problem solving, and we have a number of small companies and small farms in New Zealand where they really don't have all the skills in-house, so they've got to start partnering with other companies, other institutions, universities, and maybe the Product Development Association where they can come and network with other people like them. Tell me about the Product Development Association because this is a pretty high-powered global group that you can get access to right here in New Zealand. Exactly. Um, I think about four years ago in two, 2007, I felt there was a need to start an affiliate of the Global Product Development Association in the U.S. Uh, mainly for the opportunities to network and share knowledge within New Zealand. So I initiated the chapter and it's been really successful now. We've got about 400 professionals on the database and we organize about four or five events during the year where we have people from different companies come and share their stories uh, at these events. And the last couple of events, uh, we've had a full house. I see that uh, one of the companies now that you're working with at the university, not just Gallagher's, also Hansel's in the food, uh, food area. Yes. What exciting projects uh, are you looking at there? Um, some of the innovations are confidential, but the methodology or the rules and the basics of how the game is played is across all industries. And that's what we are trying to teach. As Paul mentioned as well, speed is important. So with this new model, we are trying to speed up the process of innovation. So it's, it's completely different. Uh, so far it was, you know, it was designing and testing and designing and testing and sometimes just guessing and then uh, finding that the prototype is just not right and going back again to scratch and that wastes a lot of time. But with this new process, we are testing out a lot of the parameters right at the start and then we are 
generating prototypes in that feasible re region so when we actually build a prototype, we know it's going to function properly. Let's talk a little bit about the climate situation. Where did that crazy idea come from anyways? How did it begin? Well, I think that the uh, one of the vineyard managers uh, was having repeated problems with the way that pruning was carried out on the vineyard. And he identified that when, you know, essentially many other aspects of the vineyard operations have been mechanized. Why couldn't this be mechanized too? So he began with essentially a problem. So he already had that value proposition box essentially ticked. And he worked with a very, very talented engineer to figure out how you could mechanize what was up until then a very manual solution. Um, and when they came to see us, for instance, they had a basic prototype and they had a patent application. And they knew that they had something very valuable, but they really didn't know how to take it to the next stage. And so what we then did is help them to assess what they had in terms of from a business, technology, and a legal perspective, and then worked with them to develop a plan, what we call a commercialization strategy, to take it from where it was right then, which is prototype and patent application, through to making money from it. And then we actually helped them to execute that plan. And that process of assessing what you've got, planning what you'd like to do with it, and then executing it is really at the heart of commercializing anything. Is it expensive to do? Um, it is an expensive process, but the rewards from it are extraordinary. Um, so this gentleman, for example, is likely to make far, you know, multiples of the amount of money that he's making off his vineyard now from this machine. Um, and really the question is to ask yourself is can you afford not to do it? Because if you're not innovating, eventually you stagnate and other people surpass you. So although it may be an expensive process, we all have to innovate and keep moving forward because if we don't, we will simply allow others to pass us by with better technologies and more effective ways of doing things. Yeah, so simply growing food uh, here in New Zealand is not going to be enough forever. Would you agree with that, Aruna? Yes, absolutely. I think we've got to add value to products. And uh, gone are the days when you just did a me too and you know com you competed on price alone. That's not sustainable. So we've got to look at unique products. We've got to be adding features that the end user wants. And that's where we're going to try and compete. We've got to put features that are not easy to copy mm. so that you can you know actually sustain that advantage over it. Yeah, and, th time. and that comes to the whole question of intellectual property. And you know that is a very tough thing to safeguard. How are we doing in New Zealand? we not doing especially well, it would be fair to say, unfortunately. Um, we tend to have quite a, an immature approach to intellectual property. Um, we either ignore it completely. There's a lot of businesses and organizations that I've seen that essentially say, we're not going to bother to deal with intellectual property at all. Alternatively, there are other businesses that have a tendency to focus on a certain narrow band of intellectual property. So most people, for example, have heard of things like patents and trademarks, but they haven't heard of other things like, for example, the know-how, confidential information, trade secrets. Those things over there are just as, or sometimes even more important than things like patents and trademarks. So what we need to do is actually develop a bit more of a sophisticated and un, uh, more advanced understanding of how to leverage all the different forms of intellectual property and most importantly, how to extract value from them rather than just spending money on them. Because we do have a great tendency in New Zealand to spend a lot of money on IP, but we don't actually extract a lot of value from it. One of the uh, programs you're following at the university now that fascinates me is based on Toyota and how they do business. Very simply, what are the secrets of their success that we should be emulating here? I think the secrets of their success is putting in a robust system in place to develop new products because um, uh, the classic uh, quote that I often uh, mention to students is that um, product development by accident and product development by a system is like the difference between a lamp and lightning. One is dangerous and risky and the other one is safe, efficient and focused. So the methods that Toyota use are a number of robust methods that actually provide system, uh, a systems approach to the uh, whole in innovation process. And that's what we are trying to adapt and uh, convey to some of these companies here in New Zealand. And they're taking it up really well. How do you think the rest of the world views us here way down in the South Pacific? What do they really think of New Zealanders and our innovation skills? Paul, I'll start with you. I think um, we do a lot of business overseas. We deal with a lot of overseas companies and organizations, and we're generally regarded as highly innovative. 
um, and I think very creative as well because they're slightly different things. But I think at the same time, uh, the results really speak for themselves. We haven't tended to have had great commercial successes. We don't have any Googles or Microsofts or Apples here in New Zealand. Um, and uh, I think that probably say, says enough. They know that we're innovative and they know we're creative. They know we come up with these great solutions, but our ability to actually transform them into the kind of wealth that the country needs to continue its standard of living, uh, we haven't got a good track record there. And I think they know that. Do you think we can do it, Aruna? Yes, certainly. I have a lot of confidence. I think we have a lot of opportunities because um, we have that uh, you know, mentality and philosophy where we can do with a little. As uh, Ernest Rutherford has said, you know, we haven't got the money, but we can think and we can think innovatively. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to do better and compete in the world stage. Thanks. Coming up after the break, future proof on the highways and byways of the economic world. Saddle up as one of our experts tells us about an exciting new project on the cards. But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. When and where did New Zealand pioneer global trade in frozen meat? Find out after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, when and where did New Zealand pioneer global trade in frozen meat? 1882 in Dunedin, with a sea voyage from Port Chalmers to London. And now it's time for Future Proof. What's coming up for our expert, James Shortle? James, you have a fascinating new project underway. Tell me all about it. Yeah, well, innovation's you know pretty hot in the uh, in the agricultural sector, and that's really going to take us forward, I think, in the, uh, with the next leap. So, you know, ASB is, uh, is is being pretty innovative over the past uh, decade or couple of decades, and so we really want to take that to the next step in the agricultural market. Um, really want to um, look at what innovations are going on in the market, show farmers, um, you know, different innovations and and how they might be able to implement some of these on farm. So to make this happen, uh, you've been going out into the paddocks, talking to farmers, uh, finding. Finding out who's doing what, uh, tell me, give me some examples. Yeah, well, unfortunately, farmers might actually see me without my without my <laughs> suit and tie on and getting out in the in the gumboots, um, seeing what innovations are happening on farm. Um, there's some pretty cool cool stuff going on, to be honest. Uh, we've got some uh, we've got some very innovative farmers out there that are really you know going to shape the way of where where farming is going to be in three or five years time. So you know at, a, at ASB, then you know we understand those sorts of things, um, and so we uh, we're really promoting it and, and trying to see see where farmers and and, and help shape them uh, to go on that journey. Now you've got a whole week set aside and you're going to work with us to provide some wonderful uh, television programming. What are you calling the week and what sorts of things will we be seeing? Yeah, so uh, we, uh, sort of the uh, the first week of November is going to be ASB Rural Innovation Week, and and as you said, that's going to we're, we're going to provide a whole lot of content along with Country 99 TV. Um, you know, going out to farmers, seeing what they're up to. We're going to have expert panelists um, talking about innovations and and how that uh, what that means to consumers, but also to farmers. So we're very excited about it, and I think farmers should also be pretty excited about it. So we're looking forward to them tuning in. And we are too. Thanks, James. We uh, we'll see you in November, if not before. Thanks to my guests, ASB Rural Economist James Shortle, Dr. Aruna Shaker, and Paul Adams. Be sure to check out the website. Meantime, going into worlds unknown is not for the faint of heart. But rest assured, new galaxies await us all. The big question is, will you flounder or fly? Enjoy the ride.
wherever you are, enjoy the view. Keep the faith. See you next time.